Okay, well good afternoon everybody. Today we're going to be talking about three simple lessons to achieve excellence in maintenance planning and scheduling. We're happy to have Mike Galoff with us, um, actually all the way over in Manchester, England. Um, so we appreciate him uh, kind of cutting into his dinner hour to, to present this webinar for us. Um, just real quick, you know, as I always say, just a little overview about UE Systems. So we've been providing ultrasound um, technology for over 40 years now, and um, you know, it's interesting as the more we develop our technology and, and the more power users that we have using it, um, we really do find ourselves in, in pretty heavy discussions about anything and everything to do with asset management. So, you know, it, it's not just about you know the ultrasound anymore, um, as far as as we're concerned. Um, and you know, with these webinars that we do each month, we we try and hit on a variety of topics and several of our webinars this uh, this year have have at least touched on planning and scheduling and it was clear from you know the questions we would get in like right right when those topics were mentioned and, and the feedback that we got that that this was obviously uh, you know something of, of extreme interest so we sought out Mike um, so that he could come and, and talk to us a little bit more about planning and scheduling um, so again just you know another way that, that we're trying to, to make sure we're or uh, serving everybody uh, the way they'd like to be. Um, if you want some more information about, about UE Systems, about the different webinars that we host, about our um, products and technology, um, you can definitely pop me a note in the questions section and I'll be happy to send you our interactive information guide. Um, that's a great way to, to see all of our past webinars, to see all of our tutorials um, and articles and, and so on and so forth. So uh, just pop me a note. And uh, before I welcome Mike, just some housekeeping. Um, we are recording this, so you'll have access to this recording after the fact. Um, if you want to share it with colleagues that couldn't pop on, you want to sit back and, and focus in on sections um, later on, then, then that'll be available to you on our website. And also, as I just mentioned, you can ask questions throughout the session. Um, you just type those into the questions box and, and we'll get to those throughout the webinar if, if something's pretty specific to a topic Mike just covered or of course you know we'll have some time at the very end. So without further ado I'm going to pop the screen over to Mike and we'll get started. All right so there you go Mike. Okay, well, thank the floor you is yours. Much. I'm you can see my slide presentation. Oops. Yes, we can see that. There it is. You can see it and you can hear me. Yes. Okay, good, good. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, oh, wow, that number says 126 people, So, and I can't see one of you. So I'm sure you're all just uh, uh, very excited to be here. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a bit about planning and scheduling today. and. Uh, uh, maybe to kind of, you know, I've got some lessons here I want to share with you through my experiences and, and, and helping people improve at this. And I think to kind of couch all these together, uh, I want to put this idea in your head. So the, the profession that we've chosen to drive uh, reliability excellence into our uh, organizations requires two sciences. And the first one is a physical science. So if I were to tell you, uh, hey, how often should we lose? replicate this bearing, I'm pretty sure that we could find a website or a book somewhere that would tell us and, you know, based on RPM and temperature and load, uh, I'm sure there's a, a scientific way to calculate the right type of grease and the frequency and how much, and I would consider that a physical science. The answer to that question is, is a scientific fact. And that's something that we're collectively decent at or, or really good at. Uh, we, we excel at that kind of thing. And uh, the opposite side of the coin is I believe our profession is also filled with a social science. So by a social science is how do we communicate with people clearly, how do we motivate people, how do we focus on goals, how do we share knowledge, how do we continually train people, and this is a social science because there is no one right answer to this question. And there's, uh, based on your local cultures and, and the people within it and, and your norms, um, uh, there's a variety of different answers. and. I would say that social science uh, related to maintenance is something that we're technically very horrible at. I mean, we're 
very much so. We're fantastic engineers and horrible communicators. So I believe that uh, achieving success at planning and scheduling requires a greater focus on the social sciences. So I think that theme will come out throughout this presentation. Um, it's really about the people so much. I, I tell people all the time, all these tactical things we do with creating schedules and job plans and, and uh, uh, Gantt charts, uh, you know, that's the easy part. It's the how do I get everybody in the organization that's needed to be on the same page and marching in the same direction and knowing what they're doing. And that requires uh, a tremendous amount of communication skills. So I hear that a lot from the planners that I work with. I didn't realize this job was such a people-oriented job, and I, I personally believe that's very true. So, so let's get into it. I've uh, I've kind of prepared three lessons for you here, if you will, and you can see them on your screen. So the first one is engaging everyone, and I, in parentheses I put operators. It's not always operators, but I hear this so often that you know they don't feel like they're part of the process or they don't see responsibilities to contribute. So how do we get all these people? Uh, pulled together and marching in that same direction. And you see some words there, role clarification. And a big one I want to drive home is something called active communication. Hey, that. hey, Mike, I don't, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think, I don't know if you've got your screen paused. All I, all I see at least is your intro slide. So I don't know if maybe you've oh. hit the pause button or, there you go. Now, now we're cooking. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. So, okay, so we have these three lessons. The first one is getting everybody involved and, and you know, what, 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 what role do I play in this and how do I contribute? Uh, so we've got a bit there. Uh, we're gonna, second, we're going to talk about this idea of quantitative task descriptions and clarifying expectations. So um, we're going to, hopefully after this webinar, we're all going to stop using the word check the gearbox. We'll, we'll take that word check and put a big red flag next to it and we'll, we'll try not to use it or at least not use it alone. So I'll make that very clear. And then finally, this idea of visual management. And I just came back from a, a great project. Uh, well, it's ongoing, but I just uh, uh, came back from a, a couple of months in the Australian Outback working with a mining company uh, focused on shutdowns. And I've got a few photographs to share with you from there and, and many others as well. But really great use of visual management. And again, the, the, the thing I want you to focus on is how does that key in with this social science of maintenance that we're that we all struggle with quite a bit. So these will be the three areas I want to talk about uh, for this hour. So all right. Let's try this. Okay, here we go. First one is role clarification. So how do I get everybody involved? Uh, first off, it's kind of unclear in our minds. You know, what do we what do we want them to do? Well, you know, we, we give them instructions like, well, just make things better or create job plans. So if we look at this slide, uh, really the target that I put on planners is uh, we have a physical way we can measure your contribution to the organization, and we see the there's a, a qualitative measure in the types of feedback that we see on work orders. So was the quality of the work order sufficient that I I could get work done in a, a reasonable time and and avoid errors and of course uh, safety problems and and uh, avoid rework. Uh, but most importantly, and the planners, you know, the the big problem we have with these planners is they're wearing way too many hats. We ask them to do a million different things. So kind of the the focal point I give to them is you owe the organization two weeks of ready backlog at all times, meaning that. I've got a pile of work orders in front of me that the planner has put their hands on, and I've done all the things that a planner does. I've specified parts and materials. I've defined the instructions for doing the job and testing requirements, and you know we could come up with a list of what is required. But there's enough work orders in that stack that we could take that and develop a work schedule for two weeks into the future. And as long as the planner is doing that, then we can start talking about adding other things to your, to your plate, if you will. Uh, so if we want them to participate in something related to spare parts or help out in the storeroom or uh, track some metrics and, and so forth, that's all great and it's it's certainly not off the table, but this has to come first. And we as an organization need to realize that the planners are really the only people that we have that are focused on work that's going to be in, done in the future. The rest of us are dealing with today's problems and we've taken these people called the planners and asked them to focus uh, on upcoming events. So we can quantify the amount of preparation they do by measuring our backlog, and it's the waiting for scheduling backlog. And again, uh, I ask them to at all times produce two weeks or maintain two weeks 
Hey. And the quality of those reporters in that ready backlog uh, are sufficient, then I call them a successful plan. Mike, your so sound is going. There for us to look at. Sorry, your sound Maybe is going in and out a little bit. This. Is it okay? Let me. Yeah, I don't know if there's anything. Could just be the connection, but. Could be the connection I'm far across the ocean. Maybe. That's true. Uh, You're but, really far away. <laughs> so let me. Maybe I'll just talk a little. Where does the planner fit in? What's the value of having a planner? So if we look at this slide, I think we can illustrate it pretty easily. So we have this idea of wrench time. So a typical maintenance worker comes to work, and if we don't put much effort into the process, we're going to see uh, wrench time. Uh, this slide says 30 to 35 percent. My experience is it's usually a lot lower. But let's just say it was 30 percent. In an eight-hour shift, that's 2.8 hours of actual physical work of affecting the equipment. Uh, in a positive way uh, in an eight-hour shift, and that's 5.2 hours on indirect activity. So uh, some of you are probably aware of this, but it's not, not a great number. And this is a very common number. Um, in fact, my experience has been that that number usually shows up to be a lot lower. It's usually closer to 20%. So if it were 20% in that eight-hour shift, we would see two hours of a maintenance worker's time affecting that equipment uh, and the rest of it going to indirect activities. Now. The answer to this puzzle is, where's the rest of the time going? Well, I'm, I'm making trips back and forth to the storeroom for parts that I should have had. Uh, I'm waiting for the next job to be assigned to me. Um, I'm waiting for the equipment to be shut down or the tank to be drained so I can actually do work on it. So it's, it's really no fault of the maintenance workers. And, and uh, a person that doesn't understand French time looking at these numbers uh, can really make some bad decisions. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, we as an organization, we as leaders, are not setting our people up for success uh, in our planning and scheduling process. So we need to do a better job to allow them to be successful, and this is where the planner comes in. So if the planner develops a good plan, if they specify the parts and the, the methods that we'll use and the testing requirements and, and good work instructions, then that will directly increase the wrench time of our people. And by way of example, we see here, if we were able to increase the wrench time from 30% to 50%, uh, which is very doable if we if we really focus on our process, uh, then we can see that a, a five person crew working at thirty percent wrench time that will yield a total of twelve hours in an eight hour day. But if we took one of those people and made them a planner, and through the efforts of that planner they increased our wrench time to fifty percent, we're going to end up with four people, but at the higher wrench time, giving us sixteen hours of work in that same day. So it's kind of crazy math, but by taking a person out of the mix and having them focus on improving our preparation for the job, we're going to get four hours more work. So I like to really uh, you know, get planners to focus on this idea. This is your contribution. You're increasing the wrench time. So all these things that detract from wrench time, waiting for the equipment, waiting for the next job to be assigned, waiting for tools, uh, this, this is your enemy. This is what you have to make go away. And the net result of that will be increased wrench time and getting more work out of our people. And we shouldn't forget, by the way, the effect that this increased wrench time has on not only productivity, but more importantly, the morale of our people. The people that are doing this work, uh, the reason they took the job is they, they like fixing things. They like working with their hands. And with wrench time values being very low, it ends up you, know, you have a very frustrated workforce. They, you know, they they tell me sometimes it's almost as if they're trying to stop us from doing what we're good at uh, because we're never prepared, we're not uh, ready to do the work. So the, you know, I don't know that it's necessary to literally measure wrench time, but a focus on increasing the productivity of the people and the planner is the, the major mechanism to make that happen. I think that's a good place to focus our uh, energies. All right. All right. So you know, back to the planner, what does the planner do? So here's a list of things that the planner does not do, and I think that's a, a you know, healthy way to look at it. Uh, we're misusing the planners quite a bit, so uh, I think this list may be from, from Cargill, if I'm not mistaken, and some collaboration with some people there. These are the types of things that we instruct their planners, you're not to be doing these things. And uh, just to kind of expand on that idea, I removed the company's name on this one, and I honestly don't even recall where it was from. 
But here we see a, li a pretty good exercise where we made a list of what is the planner going to work on and what is the planner not going to work on. And working on this with the planners is one step in that evolution of, of clarifying roles. But taking the same list out and working with leaders and operations people and saying, hey, we're really trying to get these planners focused on the future. Here's the type of things we want them to do. And we want you to help us reinforce that. And uh, I get a very positive response out of people and good results when we do this because a lot of times it's just really not clear what we want those people to do. We have job descriptions, uh, but a lot of job descriptions are written in such a way uh, there's, there's a lot of wiggle room in there and it's, it's not a high level of clarity. So uh, one of my challenges to the people on this call is, do you have a list that looks like this? Uh-oh. Are we still there? Yeah. Oh, hello. Yeah, are we, I still hear you. Okay. Still, still see you. Network dropped out there for a second. <laughs> okay. So, okay, good. So my challenge to you would be, do you have a list like this? And if you don't, how challenging would, would it be for you to, to make such a list uh, to provide clarity to what we're asking the planners to do? Uh, so I think this will be available to you later on, so maybe use this as an inspiration to kind of clarify the roles there. Boy, that's, okay. Now, this next one I'm showing you here, to take that one step further, and a tool that I use a lot of times is a, a personal agenda. So what you see in front of you, this is a planner, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is a guy in Antwerp, and uh, we're really trying to clarify their role, so we took that bulleted list that you saw on the previous slide, and we asked them to map out a typical day for them. So here you can see a, a list, it's pretty standard stuff, uh, but notice that uh, a lot of focus on the green, the green represents time out on the floor, interacting with people, shaking hands, getting information from them uh, that will be reflected ultimately in the job plan. So uh, one of the lessons that I really stress with planners is if you anticipate this job is going to be sitting behind a desk, pounding away on a computer, and not out interacting with people, you're making a horrible mistake. Uh, to be a successful planner, you've got to be on the floor, number one, to get the technical information you're going to need to create a great job plan. But more importantly, you need to build that credibility with those people that are doing the work. And if they see you as that person that never leaves the office, the credibility goes away completely. So as you see on this example, we've tried to map out 50% of their time uh, being out on the floor, interacting with people. And of course, some time at the desk working in the computer uh, is necessary, so we've mapped that time out. And then another interesting one I want you to kind of focus on is the, the stuff that's in red. And it probably looks a bit odd to you at the moment. It says face-to-face -face coffee feedback with technicians in the office. So here's the idea. Uh, as I work with people, they say, wow, we just don't get good feedback from the work that we do, so we don't have much of an opportunity to improve the future work that's done. And uh, as we look at the mechanisms we use to get that feedback, it's usually something very passive, so that we're going to learn about active and passive communication in a minute, but it's very passive. It's fill out this worksheet. It's uh, you know write some notes here. And I want you to think for a second, the people that we have doing the work uh, is it in their strong skill set to provide written feedback uh, as a mechanism to communicate these things back? And I would say no. Uh, they're used to working with their hands. They're fantastic at fixing things and solving problems. But sitting down and writing um, clearly and concisely uh, feedback to the planner, is this not a strong suit? I think it's a muscle we can build within them. Uh, but if we're struggling with good feedback and we're trying to do it in a passive way through forms or worksheets, I think the answer is right there in front of you. So here's my idea. Let's have a scheduled activity. Let's send a worker to come in and sit down with the planner. And you know the coffee is a metaphor, but for the duration of one cup of coffee. So you bring with you the most important work order that you worked on that week, and let's have a conversation, planner and worker. And tell me about this work order, and what can we do better, and what parts were missing, and uh, what tools uh, did you need, and, and what were the problems that you had. And talking face-to-face -face allows for follow-on questions and interaction. And that's really important. And the, the, the real benefit to this is when a worker sits down with the planner and they talk about just that one work order, and that improvement goes into the system so the next time that job occurs, uh, we actually the job goes smoother, we've, we've closed a loop here. And the people understand, wow, if I go tell this person, hey, add this part to the list so I'll have it the next time, that really works. And then the job goes easier the next time around. So I'm going to go talk to them when I don't have a scheduled appointment. And it's an exercise in building that habit or that ability to provide meaningful feedback 
so that we can improve in the future. And I think that's really important. We toss around this word continuous improvement all the time and I really wonder if we're really living it or if it's just a, a word we're expected to say. We need to understand that the roles, the jobs we've signed up for are never done. Job plans will never be completely done. Our bills and materials are never perfect. Our proactive maintenance strategy is never done. The only time it's done is on the day you retire and it's not even done then. It's just somebody else's problem. We can always make things better in little increments. The last piece on this cup of coffee meeting I want to tell you about is this. You're probably sitting back and saying, well, how many work orders can they really improve over a cup of coffee? It, it, probably one. And if we only do one a week and we get that one working, that one's in the bank. And next week we'll do another one, and next week we'll do another one, and over time this is going to build up. But right now with the systems we're using where we're trying to capture everything and improve everything at the same time, we're not getting any traction. So let's build the habit. Uh, let's focus on the most important things and we'll have those as captured value and we can move on to the next one the next time. So uh, I think that's being reasonable about what we're going to accomplish is important. Now to, to work outside of the planning organization, uh, I've got a bulleted list here which is a starting point to define roles and responsibilities. So that could work for us. But I want to introduce you to this idea of a RACI chart. So in front of you, you see a, a table. And it's a pretty simple table. So vertically, we have different job descriptions. And operators and supervisors are in there. Now, granted, this is a very simplified list. Uh, the job descriptions are probably different. And there's a whole lot more people there. And I've greatly simplified the activities. So if you look horizontally, these are different activities that occur within the planning and scheduling process. And again, this is greatly simplified just to facilitate the conversation. So the, the, the reason we lay it out like this is then we go ahead and uh, indicate on the chart um, the word RACI. So there's, uh, it's an acronym. There's four uh, elements to that acronym. R is responsible. A is accountable. C is consult. And I is inform. So if we really want to, in a very clear and succinct way, help people understand where do I fit in, uh, the RACI chart is the way to go. So I've, I've produced an example on the next page. Now, I'm not saying this is right for you. In fact, given that the planning and scheduling of maintenance work has so much uh, emphasis on social science, I would tell you that there is no one right answer for you. This is something that you have to explore and, and uh, develop within your own. You know, there's some tips and tools I can give you, uh, but there is no one answer. There's uh, things that will help us be successful. So we, we look at this RACI chart. Now, the rules are if you just take that first column and it says identify work document in the CMMS. So anybody that has an R in that column is responsible, meaning those are people that are, it's possible they would burn calories to carry out that task. So in this case, I put an R in every single column. So the rules of a RACI chart is every single column has to have at least one R and it could have many R's. In this case, I would propose that every single person on that list at some point in their life may have to get uh, report work that needs to be done, and the mechanism that we use is a work order. So even the store person, if they have a light fixture that's damaged or burned out in their storeroom, if they want to get that repaired, I think the correct answer is to put in a work request in the system. So uh, we would need to uh, help them understand that this is how we do it and train them on their responsibilities. Now the second element is an A. A means accountable. And if you remember back to the previous slide, it said there can only be one. So it's kind of like Highlander, right? There can only be one at the end of the day. So the person who gets the A next to them is accountable. And maybe the simplest way to look at that is, if this element is not working, who do I go yell at? So in this case, well, maybe that's a typo. I, I meant to put that under operating supervisor. Uh, but if we see that we're not using work requests in any way, Who's the one person, the buck stops here, that I go talk to and say, hey, this is not working. We need to push this forward. And uh, there can only be one, because if we put A's in multiple columns, then we allow a situation to say, well, I thought he was doing it. Uh, so every, the rules are every column has to have one A somewhere in that listing so that one job title is responsible for making that happen. And that, that is a typo. I wouldn't expect operators to be accountable. I meant to put that in operating supervisor. So again, don't be shy about that. We would look at this and say, wow, can we, as a maintenance organization, as assign responsibility to the operations group? Well, number one, we don't do this in a vacuum. And number two, heck yeah, we can. Uh, to be successful at this, 
we all need to be marching in the same direction and we're balancing the use of our resources. Resources are people, repair parts, but a huge valuable resource that we have is available time on the equipment to do repairs. And that resource is controlled 100% by the operations people. So this chart needs to reflect everyone and what, how they fit into the uh, situation. You'll also see a C. C stands for consult, so you don't have to use them in every case. Uh, but if there's someone that I would go to for advice uh, or input, uh, then uh, they would get a C. So the next one says develop the weekly work schedule. And it's logical that we would consult with operating supervisors to say, here's our proposed work schedule for next week. How does that fit in with our production schedule? Do we need to make changes? So very clearly we need to consult with them and perhaps stores or procurement people to say, hey, we're planning on doing this work. Are there materials here? Okay. Finally, we see an I. I is for inform. So who do we want to inform about the work that's going to be done, in this case, the weekly work schedule? Uh, so uh, in this case, we put an I under operators. So when we do develop that schedule, we want to inform them of the work that's being done so that they can prepare the equipment and be, and be ready for the repairs to be done. And also, more importantly, they need to know that the, the notifications of the work requests that they put in are being acted on. Uh, we can't afford to live in a vacuum, so we've got to close that loop. So this is a RACI chart simply uh, very visually illustrates the roles and responsibilities. And I look at this as a clear way to communicate what we're expecting of people. It also informs any training programs that we're going to put together. So if we're going to give Maximo or SAP training, and uh, well, what do we need to train operators on? Well, we can see it all clearly here on this chart. I would propose that if you go to any operations leader and say, I need your support to make our planning and scheduling process work, they'll pat you on the back and say, you got it, buddy. I, I love you. I'm here for you. But what does that really mean? Uh, and I think something like this RACI chart helps to close that gap between you know, emotional support or verbal support to something very real uh, as far as responsibility. So here again, I'll challenge you to see if you can define uh, the, this type of element for your organization and where everything fits in. All right, so that's roles and responsibilities. Uh, I'm going to move on to clear and active communication. And I really want to ping on this word active. I think that's really important. So let, let's take a look here. So I've got two columns here, and we've got different forms of communication. And on the left-hand column, we've got passive communication. So that's emails, text messages, uh, these big posters that we put on the wall and, and stuff that's hidden in the computer. And I'm, I don't mean to make light of that. Those are important methods of communication, but they're all passive communication. And I would say that those are enablers to success. They support what we're doing. But if we're trying to run an organization, if we're trying to be successful, if we're trying to drive continuous improvement, and this is the only means of communication that we use, our ability to be successful is hugely limited. And it's a function of the world we live in. Uh, if you think about it now, boy, we'll do anything not to talk to someone, right? I'll send them a text message, or I'll Twitter, or I'll post it on the web. Um, so one of the big sins that I hear from, from leaders is when I talk to them and say, hey, do you, are your people aware of the schedule for next week? Or do your people know what our big KPI is? What are we all here for? What are we focused on? Is it tons per hour? Is it a quality measure? And the, the word that really makes me crazy is when I hear a leader say, well, it's on our website if they want to look at it. And boy, that just makes me crazy because you know the role of a leader is to force those ideas in front of people and, and make them talk about it and get them focused on things. So this whole if they want to look at it thing is really, boy, it's just really a weakness that we need to overcome. So let's look at active communication. Look them in the eye, shorten to the point, and just in time. So all these passive means of communication are fine, but we need to uh, supplement them, or, or maybe we supplement the active communication with the passive. But we, we have to find opportunities to look people in the eye, talk to them face to face, make sure that we get buy-in and agreement. And this doesn't have to be a long meeting. Uh, really, I think this is better served when it's done in short little bursts, 10 minutes at a time, using visual controls, looking a person in the eye and saying, OK, here's our plan for next week. What do you think about that? And if they nod their head yes and say, I'm in agreement, then you have to ask, well, why are your eyebrows touching in the middle? Let's talk about this. What, do you, what are your concerns? Let's, let's have a little back and forth communication here. So I challenge you to think about all the ways you communicate with people and how many times do you take the opportunity to, do, to perform active communication. And uh, really a weak spot, and it, and it falls right into that idea of 
leveraging the social science or you know accentuating the social science of maintenance. Really a big weak point for us as engineers and uh, maintenance leaders. All right, so we talk next about, uh, and this is a, a, a communication method, if you will, uh, but leveraging quantitative inspections versus subjective inspections. So as I write a work order and I'm giving instructions to people, am I being clear about what we're asking people to do or what the outcome would be? So if you look in the left-hand side, now I've made it red, so no big mystery that not a big fan of it, but we see something uh, called subjective inspections and we see check the gearbox and inspect the belt. And I think, now I see 173 people on the call. Uh, I bet you're all raising your hands and saying, boy, we just got a ton of those laying around. The question is, what does that really mean? Now, when I challenge people on this, a lot of times the answer I get is, well, hey, Mike, uh, you need to lighten up on that. We've got workers here that have been here 35 years. They know how to check a gearbox. You know, if you go, at, if you go give them details, they'll be insulted. So here's a little tool that I use and, and I challenge this thinking is bring me, bring me five of those guys that have been here 35 years. Let's sit them down at the table. I'm going to give all five of them a blank piece of paper and just write down some bullet points about what it means to you to check the gearbox. Now, if the, if the sole determination is years on the job, uh, then those five pieces of paper should be identical. Uh, but we're talking, you know, when it's inspecting a gearbox, this is back in the camp of a physical science. So there needs to be one right answer for that. There's one right setting on a welding machine to produce a certain type of weld with a certain type of metal. There's one correct pressure to get optimal seal performance out of a mechanical seal. There's a right and a wrong answer to these things is physical science. So if, if, we're, if we're successful through this passive or this subjective communication, then all five of those pieces of paper need to be the same. Now, I think you all know those five pieces of paper are not going to be the same. Uh, so it tells us we have an opportunity. So we look in the column that says quantitative inspection. This is a better way of giving instructions to people. And uh, kind of the litmus test that I use is every one of these statements needs to yield a yes or no answer. So if you send me out to inspect the gearbox and you give me this criteria, when I come back, if everything's okay, uh, then I'm only allowed to answer to, you, to a question that says, is that gearbox satisfactory? I can only answer yes or no. And if I say yes, end of conversation, because we both know exactly what we're talking about. If I say no, well, let's talk about it a little bit more. Why do I think it's not satisfactory? And we can talk with facts and data, not emotions. So every one of those statements, believe it or not, yields a yes or no answer. So no loose or missing fasteners. No means zero, so even one missing faster, one loose faster, that's, that's a failure in the system, unsatisfactory. Uh, oil level in the green band on the site glass, again, that's, I would say that's a digital answer. Either it is or it isn't. So it's either in that range or it's not. Now, I see a lot of site glasses marked with a pencil mark, or maybe somebody took a Sharpie out there and put a little scratch mark on it, and that's, that's good. That's moving in the right direction. It yields the question, well, when do we have a problem? If it's just a little bit off the mark or a lot off the mark, I mean, what, what are we looking at here? So we put an actual band and it's in or it's out. And then we've got oil temperature 160 plus or minus 20. So I see a lot of us putting our toes up to the line on this one. I'll see some sort of inspection form that says oil temperature 160. It bears the question, when do we have a problem? Is it at 161 or 162? You know, when do I call the Marines in to take action? So we need to be a little bit clearer about our expectations here. Now down below you see one that says COPL for acceptance criteria. OPL stands for one point lesson, so I want you to hold that thought for a second. And two or three slides down the road we're going to explain that. But it's, a, it's the use of pictures and visuals uh, to explain things that aren't so easy to explain in, in words. So I would propose this. If we take the time, and you know, this is, we've got a whole career to work on this stuff, uh, but if we take the time to drive away from subjective inspections towards quantitative inspections, it provides a lot of benefit to our organization. And uh, I want to tell you what that benefit looks like. So here it is. On the left-hand side, the results when we use primarily subjective inspections. First off, the time to perform the inspection is maximized. It's unclear. We talk in generalities, so that pump's broken, that valve's no good, the piping system's all full of leaks. Uh, we have no basis for improvement, and most importantly, there's a whole lot of drama going on. So I, I make the joke all the time, if I sent one of you out to inspect the gearbox with instructions that said, check the gearbox, and you come back, and uh, next week the gearbox fails, well, it's 
we don't need to have any big meeting on this. It's clear what's wrong. Uh, you that inspected the gearbox did it wrong because you inspected it. Next week it failed. You're the problem. Now, that's not true, but that's the kind of environment that we live in. We start pointing fingers and blaming people. But the truth of the matter is maybe none of us know what it really means to inspect that gearbox. When we drive towards quantitative inspections, uh, we talk with facts and data. The drama goes away. We talk openly without fear of repercussions. Uh, it's based on facts. So if I go back to that previous slide, and if I sent a worker out to inspect the gearbox with those three elements as the criteria, and next week the gearbox fails, and we find out that the breather was clogged, so the, the, the gear case pressurized and put a crack in the gearbox, uh, and we go back and ask the worker, did you check the breather? Well, of course I didn't check the breather. It's not on our list. This list represents our collective best understanding of what it means to check that gearbox. None of us knew that the breather was a problem. So nobody's fault, but let's add the breather to the list and let's start checking it moving forward. And now we've learned and we've improved based on that. No blame, no pointing fingers. People don't come to work purposely trying to make a mistake. It's us collectively as a group. We don't make it easy for them to be successful. So again, this, this idea of quantitative inspections and being clear about it, uh, what we're trying to get people to do and expectations, uh, driving towards this continually from now till, till we retire is really an important element uh, to the program. Uh, so here's a checklist of you know what are our expectations uh, on a job plan. So I would challenge you to say what you know what does our list look like? What is a perfect work order or a great work order in our organization? You know do we have an example of that? Now this is from one of my customers what we put together. So this helps drive performance in the right direction. Uh, one thing I'll challenge the people on the phone and some of your planners uh, is we have a list like this and it helps us to drive to better performance. But I don't want you as a planner to accept the idea that, well, I did everything that was on the list, so I did my job. So if things went south, not my fault. Uh, when people ask me all the time, you know, what do I need to put on a job, uh, you know, a work order? What's a good job plan look like? I want to step back a second and say, I want you as a planner to accept responsibility to produce high quality work in the optimal time and, and not get anybody hurt. So what do you got to do to make that happen? And when you focus on the outcome rather than the tactical mechanism to get there, that really changes the whole story. So is this the right list that helps us be successful? Yeah, I think it's pretty good. But I don't want people to fall back and say, well, my job is just to fill out a, a worksheet with this information and whatever happens, happens. I want you to feel it in your heart a little bit that I'm making a difference. And through the jobs that I plan, um, you know, I affect the people on the floor. And I want you to put yourself in their shoes. What would they need to be successful? And don't worry about complying with a worksheet. If you focus on the end result, the right answers will come. So again, what does your checklist look like? Do you have examples of perfection? Uh, and if you don't, uh, take some time. Invest a day or two to sit back as a group collectively and just come up with that one good example and share that with everyone and say, OK, let's do this 10,000 more times, and, and then we're really accomplishing something. So what does good look like? Here's the one-point lessons I talked to you about. I like to use these to supplement uh, the communication uh, because if I said, you know, check the oil temperature 160 plus or minus 20, well, that's pretty clear. But if I told an electrician, hey, go inspect the commutator to see the, the uh, you know, how the brushes are wearing on the commutator, uh, I'm no electrician, but I've, I've seen pictures of this stuff. That's pretty hard to describe in words. You know, if you see this wear pattern, it means wrong brushes. If you see this wear pattern, wrong angle, this one means spring tension. I just don't know how the heck you're going to describe that with words. So a one-point lesson is a fantastic way to do those types of things. So the, the rules to a one-point lesson are simple. You get one piece of paper, and uh, what are you going to do? Simpler is better. Less words, more pictures. Be creative. Use colors. Uh, use arrows. Uh, whatever you got to do. And the idea is to keep things simple. So here on this page, you see an example of uh, uh, inspecting a belt and this this really came out of a conversation where we were putting some inspection criteria together and the guy said I want them to check the belt and uh, boy that word check is just a big red flag for me now whenever I hear it my ears get kind of red and I said well the check's not good enough what do we what do we ask him to look for be a little more specific and we kind of went round and round and round so uh, the final thing was let's just grab a camera and go take a picture of a good one and a bad one 
And if we ever see a belt that looks like the bad one, time to replace it. So that's really a, the end of a, a long, drawn-out conversation that you're seeing there on the page. I've got a couple more for you. And uh, here is a uh, seal pot for a double mechanical seal. And uh, this comes as a result of we walk out there and say, boy, you know, those seal pots are really important to get good seal performance out of, uh, out of here. We have to have uh, proper flushing fluid or you know, cooling fluid going to the seal. And everyone nods their heads in agreement. Yep, that's true. But when you get down to specifics and say, well, what are we really looking for here? Boy, it's, it's surprising. Uh, we don't have a collectively right answer. And uh, so we, we, you know, together we talked and we said, well, you've got to have the right pressure and the right level in the seal pot. I said, great, what's the right pressure? And nobody knew. And what you know is we walked around this facility and we went and asked uh, different engineers and different mechanics and different people that were involved. We said, hey, we think this pressure is important. They said, oh, yeah, that's critical. You've got to have the right pressure or the seal will fail. We said, great, what's the right value? And it turns out nobody knew. And I run into this all the time when we say it's important to check this air pressure, it's important to check this level, it's important to ensure X, Y, and Z. When you get down to brass tacks and try to be quantitative, you'd be surprised how many people don't know. In fact, it's very likely that nobody in your organization knows. So in this case, uh, we found the right answer. We put together this one-point lesson, and uh, this was extremely helpful for these people. It helped them to explain uh, how this thing worked and what, uh, you know, what we're looking at when we, we take a glance at this. And you'll see a bullet point in there that actually tells you also uh, if this is not happened correctly, and this happens to be in pounds, great uh, pounds sterling, uh, so each seal costs 1,500 pounds, so it helps to communicate how important this is to get this right. And that's a, a big add to the, the process as well. So pretty simple, use of pictures, bullet points. Uh, this one maybe has a little bit too many words in it still. We could find ways to simplify it. But think about where could I use this one-point lesson to supplement my communication to other people. Uh, something like this inserted into a job plan for a tricky point or a place where people could make a, a mistake or cause an error. Uh, or, or heaven forbid fall into a potential safety hazard. Uh, just the investment of it, these things take all of 10 minutes to, uh, to put together. The other challenge I want to give to you is this. Imagine a world where once a week you got all your people together uh, for 10 minutes before you sent them out to work and you pulled out one one-point lesson. You said, all right, this week we're going to talk about seal pots. So here we go. And you spent five or 10 minutes talking about it and then you went on with your business. Imagine if you did this once a week uh, for a whole year, and you know you take vacations into account, so maybe every person gets some sort of 10-minute training uh, 48 weeks of the year, and you'd, you'd be a long way towards success if you just invested that small amount of time. Adults learn best is short little burst, being very visual, something that pertains to them right now, not some theoretical or academic exercise into the future. This is what's really meaningful to adult learners. So I would challenge you as leaders to find a way to incorporate these into your, your toolkit. I've got one more here, and this one's got a lot less words. So this one is a CIP, so when you're working on the clean and play system. So this organization has a piping system, and uh, periodically they run some caustic fluid through the piping system to clean it out so the next batch can come through. This may be a food, uh, food plant of some sort. So I, you know, we could give a person a list and say, make sure you're well in the, wearing the Tyvek suit and the nitrile gloves when you work on CIP, and the logical question is going to be, what the hell is a nitrile glove? Uh, but if you give them this one-point lesson, what's the message? When you work on the CIP system, you've got to look like this guy. Uh, short and to the point, takes all the ambiguity out of the equation, and it takes you know, five minutes. It, you know, the, the hardest part of putting this together was dressing the guy up and taking his picture, and then you know, think about the clarity of communication that comes out of this. All right, last but not least, we've got just a few minutes left here. I want to talk about visual management. So. Uh, it goes along with active communication, uh, but it's, it's pulling stuff out and making it visual and, and driving good performance with it. So um, as I mentioned, I just came back from a project where I was working on shutdowns with a mining company in the Australian outback, so there's some great examples here. Uh, so uh, a lot of this is uh, pertaining to shutdowns. Uh, so here we see an example. Uh, we see bad, better, and best, and believe it or not, I've had all of these presented to me at different parts of my career saying this is our shutdown plan. And every single person uh, swore up and down that what they were doing was sufficient. So the first one, I think we, I hope we all agree, 
uh, that that's really not going to get the job done in a shutdown. If we've got hundreds of people working on complex jobs, uh, not going to get the job done. A lot of people would argue that the next one, a list of jobs, is, is good enough. That's all we need. We don't need to invest the time in this fancy Gantt chart. My question to you would be, with that one in the middle that says better, with a simple list of jobs, can you tell me where multiple jobs that use the same resource are occurring? So for example, I need to make a lift with a crane. Which one of those jobs are going to be occurring at the same time uh, and that use that same resource? Uh, working off that list, can you tell me adequately that we're on schedule, ahead of schedule, or behind schedule? I don't think you can. So taking the time to develop the Gantt chart that we see on the right, and you can see a lot of colors in there, and honestly, this particular one's not my Gantt chart, so I, I don't know 100% what the colors mean, but for the people working with this, uh, uh, it brings the information to the forefront. Everybody's on the same sheet of music. Uh, this is from a steel mill, and this is a, an illustration of their war room that they set up. So there's their Gantt charts on the wall. You see a contact listing, so all the players in the shutdown and what's their cell phone number. Uh, I also like to put down what hotel they're staying, what room they're in. So uh, it's 2.30 in the morning. i got to get a hold of this guy. I'm not, I'm not too proud to go knock on his door and, and rack him out of bed to get some help on things. Uh, but very visual. Uh, people stand around, look at this stuff, and it really drives a much clearer communication. Uh, again, just another one with the, the idea that everything's so very colorful. Uh, I look at this one, and I like to share this with people all the time, and this is a, clearly a Gantt chart, and uh, you know, what about this Gantt chart makes you feel good? Now, I wasn't here at this shutdown, but I look at this and I say, man, look at all the scribble marks. I got a feeling these guys are using this, that it's really driving their performance, that they're making decisions based on what we had planned on doing, so this, to me, is a great example of visual management. It's not, and this is a trap we fall into all the time. Uh, we say, "Well, we gotta, we gotta put the Gantt chart up on the wall to manage our shutdown," and we print it out one day before and we stick it to the wall, and then we never look at it again. And boy, that's just a false sense of security, isn't it? So, this one, whoever shut down this was, and wherever I got this picture from one of my colleagues, I just like to show this example of, "Wow, this is really, this is real. This is meaningful." Now, this is a war room I just worked on recently. This is a shutdown at a, uh, a mine in the Australian outback, and this is kind of a panoramic view to show you some of the pieces and parts that we were using to manage the shutdown. And uh, this is a map, so we took the facility that we're working on, and uh, before the shutdown, we took some time to, uh, we took a drawing and we marked it up, and you know, from where you're sitting, it probably doesn't mean a ton there, uh, but let me walk you through it. So uh, blue is a uh, pedestrian exclusion zones. Orange is where the pedestrians could walk. We've marked uh, first aid stations where they could get water. We've marked uh, placement of cranes, so they used a lot of mobile cranes on this job. And where are those going to be placed? We've got lighting rigs and generator sets. Uh, we've got lay down areas for scaffolding and spare parts. And uh, there's even a bus stop. So buses brought workers in and dropped them off at the work site. So where's the bus going to stop? Uh, so all the things are illustrated there. And one of the key things about a shutdown is we're bringing a lot of strangers in that have never been here before and they don't know where anything's located. So we went the extra mile to, we kind of cleaned this up on a computer, printed them out and issued this to all the people that showed up for the shutdown. So they had a package that included a lot of things, including uh, a cleaned up copy of this drawing. Uh, and it really enhances communication and efficiency during the shutdown. Because if I need a spare part, I got a map in my pocket and it tells me exactly where to go. Uh, so it didn't take a huge investment of time to put this together. Just the planners preparing for that shutdown, collaborating. This goes up in the war room. It's very visual. It goes in the back pocket of all the people working, and it takes a lot of the guesswork uh, out of the equation and really drives some great performance. This is a, a portion of our Gantt chart for the shutdown, and we can see uh, uh, visibly where we're at. And uh, we put this string in place to indicate the current time so we could very clearly see where we're at against target at any given time. And you see off to the right, we uh, started a little list there to write down the challenges that we were having. And I think what we were doing with the green was, what are we doing about that challenge? So some delay happened uh, that added three hours to the job. And then uh, if you look there in green, there's something we were doing to, to deal with that. This is not a conversation you can have off the top of your head. Uh, the fact that these were posted on the wall, and uh, people came in a little bit before our update meetings, and they would color them in, and we would talk with facts about where we are and where do we need to be. It just really drives great performance uh, out of the people. So this is just the section that's the critical path. And I think, uh, let me skip ahead just a hair here. 
there's the near critical path. So we also focused on those things that if they went a little bit too long, they could become the new critical path. And again, you probably don't know what's going on in there. The text is too small. Uh, but you look at that and you could say, wow, I got a good sense of where they're at based on where they should be just from the silly colors that are, are sitting there. Uh, so that really, again, helps us. Let me back up a couple here. Uh, some other issues. So we were tracking emergent work very visually. Uh, we, had, uh, we struggled a bit with some smaller safety incidents, uh, incidents coming out. Uh, but having those on board and using a safety cross like you see on the bottom uh, really got us to the point where we're like, man, that list is too big and I'm not feeling good. So we actually had a 10-minute safety shutdown and we focused people, uh, hey, this is what's going on and we need to do better. And you know, not, not yelling at them, but saying, guys, let's just take a moment, let's take a deep breath, um, and let's, let, let's really focus on your brother here and make sure that we don't get anybody hurt. And we gave them some specific feedback based on the things we were seeing. And... Uh, at that moment, that was about halfway through the shutdown, never had as much as a scratched finger from that point forward because we just reset the clock and focused people there. And then I think on the, uh, the right-hand side, what you're seeing here is delays. So what were the things that happened uh, that are slowing us down? So you come into work, you know, it's a 24-hour schedule. You come into work at 5.30 to see where you're at, and uh, you spend the first five minutes scanning these boards, looking at progress, what happened the night before. So it yields clean, precise communication uh, on turnovers. And this doesn't happen uh, with stuff stuck in a computer or diaries or notes. Uh, this happens quickly and cleanly uh, by using these visual visual tools. Now, let me show you, yeah, this one right here. Let's take a look here. So this is me. I'm, you know, 15 minutes early for the, uh, the communication meeting, and uh, I'm sitting in a chair, and I got my iPhone in my hand, and I kind of sneakily take a picture of this guy uh, updating the, the Gantt chart. Now, there's a good story behind this. Uh, when we started this, we built all these boards. Actually, we built the boards, and we had it in a totally different room. And this organization, the guys were like, eh, I don't know if that visual management, come on, that's, we just got to focus on the shutdown. So they weren't big fans of it. So me and the group that were helping them out here, we actually found these whiteboards and we brought the, the visual war room to them. So we rolled them in the room, and at first we sat there with some pens, and we very politely said, hey, just tell me where you're at. I'll mark this up, and uh, maybe a Fifth and a half later, this became the focal point of managing that shutdown. So uh, here's a guy coming in and without being prodded, picks up the pen and marks it. And he's, they're having discussions about facts and where we at and specific things, not generalities. Uh, so I just kind of quickly snapped a, a photograph of this guy. So I was pleasantly, I was really pleased at this moment because, you know, just in a, a 12, 14 hour period, it went from that we're not interested to this. This was the defining moment for us. This helped us to be successful and people were doing it on their own and, and, and really uh, managing things closely. So I think that's, that's really an important part of this. Uh, here are some more about the critical path. You can see that line there. At the bottom is something we're using called an S-curve, so we're tracking current performance against we anticipated, and there's a whole stack on there because we were updating it probably every, every six hours. Uh, but here again, uh, imagine the, you know, this in itself, maybe looks impressive to you, but imagine the conversations that went on behind the scenes with this stuff. Really powerful stuff, and you don't get this by people sitting around the table looking at each other and saying, what do you got? Uh, this level of visual management is critical to your success. And uh, again, the near critical path, and uh, yeah, there's our safety cross, and uh, boy, you know, seeing those four red marks in a row really cause us to take a pause and say, I'm not feeling comfortable. Uh, these are all smaller issues, but they're going to turn into bigger ones. Let's stop for a moment. Let's reset the clock. Let's talk about what we're doing. And we are able to string together good, safe performance just by visually displaying what's going on. All right. So and, uh, it wasn't by design, but it worked out. I'm almost landing exactly in the right time. So uh, just a little bit of closing advice. Where do we begin with all this? And here's what I want you to focus on. Number one, start small. And, and don't be shy about banking your success a little bit at a time. When I work with customers, they say, we have to go fix all of our bills and materials because they're not correct. We've got to get them all done by the end of the year. I say, man, you're just setting yourself up for failure. This thing about getting everything right and moving on to the next thing is, is, a, is a losing proposition. What's the process? So set targets for yourself. And we can't fix all the job plans in the world, but can we get one a week? and get it really good and make sure that we're gaining some value out of that and it's improving our performance and let's call that a victory and let's do it again next week and let's do it the week after that. Uh, 
look to the key indicators. So what are we trying to accomplish? Are, are we trying to drive down, uh, reduce uh, maintenance delays? Are we trying to reduce costs? Well, what's that thing we're trying to accomplish? And make sure we're only doing activities that directly relate back to that. The field that we work in, maintenance and reliability, is filled with a whole ton of activities. And somehow we, it's very easy for us to fall in the trap of, I'm going to give credit for long lists and big, thick work orders and uh, big, extravagant uh, plans. And simpler is better. And you know, what does simple look like? Only those things that I can make a valid case affects our performance. And we need to be clear about how we're measuring performance. If it's throughput, if it's OEE, if it's tons per hour, whatever it is, test every activity, everything you're doing. Is it providing value back to that? And if not, we got to talk about stop doing it. And then finally, communicate. And, uh, and when I say communicate, uh, at this point, communicate actively. Uh, when we have a little bit of success, tell people, because you did this, we had a positive outcome. Let's keep doing it. And make sure that we're, you know, go a little bit over the top with this stuff and make sure that people understand these things that don't come naturally to you. Providing feedback face-to-face -face is not a normal activity for people like us. But because you did that, we had a positive outcome. And it will help them justify in their minds the things that we're asking them to do. Okay, so that's a lot of talking by me. I'm hoping maybe we have a question or two, Maureen. Have, have you got any to come in? Uh, oh, yeah, you've, you've stirred the pot uh, okay. extensively right. here. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, so we probably probably won't get to all of them, but uh, sounds like you've got a, a nice long flight home tomorrow. Maybe you can spend some of your flying hours uh, <laughs> responding to some of these questions offline. <laughs> so there you go. Um, so let's just kind of hit on a couple of these. So one question, and it kind of came up a few times in, in different iterations, but the gist kind of being, you know, you talked at the beginning about, you know, making sure as a planner you're you're not just holed up in your office; that you're out on the on the floor. You're out um, building your credibility, including um, the workers um, in the process, having those coffee feedback sessions. But where do you kind of draw the line? Because at the end of the day, it really is up to the planner to to plan the work. So so how where's that line, and and how do you kind of keep the workers from essentially taking over and, and dictating dictating the plan? Yeah, it, 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 you know, it goes back to what does success look like, and uh, you know, what do we need collectively? We're we're marching to the same goal. So, um, I expect the planner to be an, a good communicator to understand what we're trying to accomplish, and uh, and to somehow direct the conversation that they're having with these people. Um, you know, I, I've not really run into too many problems where the planners adding things to the job plan that are incorrect because they got pressured into doing it. I, I feel like if, if we really talk openly as adults about, you know, what does good look like, what are we trying to accomplish here, and we're, we're working towards the same goal, uh, we'll come up with good answers. So I don't know, if I understand the question correctly, you know, where do you draw the line? Uh, I think, you know, if it's, if it's time-based, well, we have to supply that two weeks to ready backlog, that's, a, that's an absolute in the situation. So I can only spend enough time out there interacting with people that I can still accomplish that. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a presence, I guess, to build that credibility and, and, and make people believe that their voice is being heard, that they're part of that solution. So it, it's not that uh, the planner only records what people tell them. Uh, that would not be correct. But they take that input from the people, uh, clean it up a little bit, word it in a proper way, add some photographs, uh, use their own experiences. Uh, so really what we're trying to accomplish here is that when a worker gets a work order and they can read it and say, boy, I, I remember that conversation. That's not exactly my words, but I get the gist of it, and i got to accept some ownership on this thing. I, I was part of making this what it is, and uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, but it's not uh, – if, the, if, the, if we're concerned that the planner just becomes a recorder for the people on the floor, no, their own experiences and knowledge and drive has to go in that as well. All right, good. Um, <clears throat> here's here's a comment from someone with with a question at the end. So, it's somebody that works in oil and gas, where the mechanical instrument and electrical are the ones doing the planning, execution, and reporting. Um, and so, so technically, they're really the position of having an actual planner and an actual scheduler just isn't in the cards for them. So, what are some tips um, for for organizations that are dealing with that? And I'm I'm sure. He's not the only one uh, working in a situation like that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, good question. So, um, 
I run into this sometimes and people say, hey, we can't afford to do it or we're just going to let the workers plan for themselves. So driving, you know, it goes back to what do I, what's the output of the planner? So if I say the, the people that are doing the work are also the planners, I think those same rules apply. So are the job plans that we're seeing, uh, the things that drive the performance of the work, do they meet our requirements of what a good job plan would look like? And, you know, uh, I've got some ideas about what a good job plan looks like, and I always challenge people to push, push the horizons there, you know, what it looks like. But are they providing the quality work, uh, the quality planning that it requires to do that job? And then number two, am I getting enough ready backlog uh, so that I can schedule work into the future so I can be, you know, working proactively? If we don't have ready backlog, I guarantee you, you're a reactive organization. That's a differentiating point there. So if we've planned work in advance and we've prepared to go do that work as efficiently as possible, uh, then we're, we're we're working towards being proactive. But if we're if we're if we're not doing that, if we have no ready backlog, then we might as well be like Henry Ford on the first industrial assembly line. We just have a big group of people standing around waiting for the next thing to break and dispatch them out there and do it. So uh, I think that it's true. It, uh, I think it's a big struggle if you're trying to get the workers to do the planning as well because uh, you know they're they're focused on today's problems and this is this is a huge huge thing with the the planning process is having some resource focused on tomorrow while some of the resources are fighting the fires of today and you got to draw a very distinct line in there I would caution you to make sure that you are adequately planning for tomorrow we're just reacting to tomorrow when we get in you know tomorrow morning. So, you know, I think you can measure it with that uh, uh, ready backlog and the quality, some sort of review of your work orders. Are they quality work orders? Are they driving good performance of our people? And I think that's the test. All Oops. right. Well, we've got, there's, there's quite a few more. Some of these folks, it sounds like they've got, they'd probably really benefit from having, having some offline conversations with you. So I think we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, you did, maybe you want to just touch real quick on um, the documents you sent to me that you wanted me to share out um, and what folks can expect yeah, yeah. to receive. Five or two, or maybe I deleted my presentation. Oh, here we go. It's okay. So if you're looking at the screen. Oh, let me pass I it back to you. Read. Sorry. I had yeah. stolen the screen from you. I'll, I'll, I'll pass it back. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Okay. Can you see that? Um, it's probably loading. There you go. Um, yep. Now we're good. Okay, good. So what I've done is I've given, this is just a little snapshot of it, but I've given Maureen a couple of files and I've asked her to send it out to all of you. And this is what we call a maturity matrix. So we at GEPL, I put these together. And the two I've asked her to send you are related to planning and scheduling. So uh, I don't want to get all high and mighty here. This is our opinion of what good looks like. We've taken some time to map it out. Uh, the way you read these things, there's different elements. I've never sat down and counted them, but there's two big giant sheets of paper here, double-sided. So there's quite a few things on there. And what I would challenge you to do is sit down and look at these things and uh, kind of consider which of these statements best represents your organization and uh, use it as a sort of a grading tool and then look at the other descriptions and say, where do I want to go with this? And it's kind of a self-assessment tool. It helps you to map out your future and where do I want to improve. Uh, so uh, you'll be getting that via email. Uh, and I would just challenge you to use that. To, this is our opinion at GP Allied working together with our the greatest minds we were able to assemble, so we've got some pretty talented guys there, and uh, we just offer this as advice to people. So look for that in your inbox, and uh, if you have any questions on that, I mean, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I think I do have my email address here. Um, Maureen, I don't know. I'd be happy to answer more of those questions. Maybe, I don't know if there's a forum where I can maybe respond to these on a blog or something, or maybe, maybe we can talk offline about that. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll figure that out. I'll, I'll what I'll probably do is I'll pass some of these questions um, with the contact information for the individuals asking them, and, and you guys can have some offline discussions for some of the ones that are a little more specific to, to a certain person's um, organization. And then um, what I like to always suggest, too, is you know with our LinkedIn group, um, our UltraPro users LinkedIn group, that that's always a good place to have some conversations, too. So. Um, one way or another, we'll, we'll get everybody's uh, questions answered and, and maybe have some good topics for some future uh, newsletter articles or blog posts or, or whatnot. So, um, you, yeah. If you've got any of those that say, boy, this guy's way out to lunch, maybe just lose those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
we'll talk about those two. <laughs> Point taken. Okay. All right. Well, um, I think with that, I'm going to, um, I've got a couple wrap-up slides here, but Mike, thank you so much. That was really, really great information and appreciate you taking the time at the end of uh, what sounds like a busy three weeks of, of nonstop travel um, to, to provide these lessons to us today. I'm, I think it was obviously pretty well received, um, just, you know, at least based on the conversations that were going on in the the questions box so that was really great and really appreciate it and hope you have a safe trip uh, back uh, back home tomorrow yeah happy to do it anytime so yeah uh, thanks for your time I, I was really a uh, big number on the uh, the listing there so yeah a little bit nervous but I couldn't see your faces so it's you know, yeah, it's always it's always good when you, you it's not like you're looking at the room of uh, 170 people uh, we're all hiding behind our computers but uh, but really appreciate it so um, with that, I just for those of you that are still on, I've just got a couple wrap-up slides. So as always, um, our website and, and obviously GP Allied's website, which which he just had up there and, and we've shared out in a couple of the invites, great resource for um, additional information related to this topic that we talked about today and of course all the other topics that we've covered in the past. Um, all of our previously recorded webinars are up online, available to, to view. Um, so, and, and a lot of them from, from Mike's colleagues um, with Allied Reliability. So, um, take a look at those and, uh, you know, obviously if you also have topics that you'd like to see us covered, please share that with us um, because we obviously want to tailor these, these events to you guys. Um, stay connected with us. Like I mentioned, we've got our LinkedIn group, great place to take the conversations from today offline. Um, actually just to another version of online um, and uh, you know share those help help answer questions with your own experience ask questions um, just you know great way to stay in touch with with your colleagues and, and peers throughout the the globe um, you can also follow us on Twitter we've got our blog um, so just lots of lots of ways to keep in touch we do have we are going to have a, a webinar in November and December we're just trying to get all the pieces uh, lined up for that so stay tuned you guys will obviously get invites for those but of course we just always want to make sure you've got our conference dates um, in front of you so our ultrasound world and our reliable asset world conferences being co-located May 13 through 16 in Clearwater Florida um, the reliable asset world conference topics just like what Mike talked about today, the planning and scheduling, just anything and everything to do with asset management, that's the, that's the home for those topics. And Ultrasound World, of course, as the title um, says, it, it's where we're going to focus on best practices in, in ultrasound. So um, keep those in mind, mark your calendars, and, and check out, obviously, our, our overall training calendar as well for our level one classes and things like that. And with that, I'll leave our contact information up here. Um, so if you do have questions, obviously get in touch with us. And for those of you that didn't get your questions answered, I will get those to Mike, and uh, we'll definitely get you, get you some answers. So with that, everybody have a great uh, rest of the day, and we'll uh, see you all next month.